But on average, if you do that estimate, you conclude that around 2035, every new aircraft that is delivered will need to be zero emission over its lifetime in order for us to meet a net zero 2050 goal. And so there are a couple ways you could do that, right? It could be a, a new aircraft delivered in 2035 that is compatible with 100% SAFs. And then subsequently you use a zero emissions SAF through its entire lifetime. Alternatively, it might be a hydrogen aircraft or an electric aircraft where also that fuel is produced with zero emissions upstream. Welcome to Sustainability in the Air, the world's first podcast dedicated to sustainable aviation. I'm your host, Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simply Flying. Every Thursday, I have important conversations with top aviation executives, technology entrepreneurs, and policymakers helping aviation take climate action. Conversations that help separate the signal from the noise. Whether you are a frequent flyer or an airline executive. If you care about sustainability or simply love traveling, welcome aboard. Dan is the Aviation Program Director at the International Council on Clean Transportation. Some of you may be familiar with Dan because he was the first non-airline executive I had on this show. He's also the first person who is coming on for a second time and that is Because he's been doing very important work as part of the ICCT with the likes of Google and American Airlines, contrail reduction work with the likes of MIT. And there are lots of important updates that he and I speak about today that are so important towards sustainable aviation from a frequent flyer levy to why beyond 2035, every single aircraft sold will need to be carbon neutral, either through SAF or through technology. So let's hear it from Dan. Dan, great to be speaking once again. You were one of the first guests on this show in season one, believe it or not, in 2022. (laughs) It sounds like a long time ago, but you were the first non-airline and non-technology CEO I had on the show. Uh, I think you were the only pseudo-climate aware activist slash uh, research person I spoke with your interview did so well that you're the first one ever making a second appearance great uh what has changed in the last two years give us a rundown yeah well it's been a really exciting time for us um obviously there's been a huge explosion in interest in sort of the environmental impacts of aviation over the past two years so that's been great to see um previously my role was kind of twofold uh, first of all, was on the research side. So putting about putting out public studies about um, climate change impacts and fuel efficiency comparisons of airlines, et cetera. Uh, that was one. And then two, I do represent civil society uh, as an expert in the environmental working groups uh, of the UN. Those have been my two main roles kind of going back 15 years. Uh, what's been really new and exciting for us since 2022 is doing a lot more partnerships. So since there are more groups that are coming into the space, um, I've been able to work more directly with not only industry partners, but governments and other non-governmental organizations like uh, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, Rocky Mountain Institute, et cetera. So uh, that's kind of the direction it's been going. It's been a lot of fun to take our research uh, and apply it directly to these partnerships with, uh, with a variety of groups that are a, a bit newer in, in the space. This is uh, very exciting. You mentioned the industry partnerships. Are you able to run us through some of the more prominent partnerships that you're working on right now? Yeah. I mean, so the the primary one is our work with Google to mature uh, tools to support low carbon travel search. Uh, And I'm I'm excited to talk about that one at length. Um, Google has developed a model called the travel impact model, uh, which they are developing into a global standard for providing emissions estimates to consumers at the time of booking. Uh, And within the Google work, there are a lot of representatives of uh, airlines and governments and NGOs and research organizations that are helping to inform that work. So that's the main one. Um, But 
We do continue to do work with the Science-Based Targets Initiative uh, and um, also more direct research with uh, IATA and the airlines themselves. So, for example, ICCT was one of many groups that put out a technology roadmap for net zero aviation. And one thing we've been doing this year is sort of comparing our roadmap versus that from the airlines and other governments and see where there's commonalities and drawing policy conclusions from those. So let's talk about TMI or the travel impact model that mm-hmm. you're, uh, you're, you mentioned with Google. I'm sorry, TIM, not <laughs> TMI. Yeah. I believe it is Tim. Underpin- it. Yeah. Tim. Tim is mm-hmm. underpinned by a need for accuracy and transparency. Can you explain why this is essential in simple terms and what are the issues you're trying to solve when there are so many models out there to calculate CO2 emissions and measure emissions? Why this new model called the travel impact model? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, And actually, I'm going to add a third principle into the mix here, and that's the idea of precision, because this is also important and and helpful to understand how the TIM work is different from some of the other carbon calculators. But just to kind of define the terms, um, accuracy points to, um, on average, how close do the modeled emissions um, line up with actual data from the airlines? That's the accuracy component. Um, Precision uh, refers to the ability to distinguish between uh, more and less carbon intensive flights. Uh, and it's a little bit different for ac- from accuracy because you can be accurate in general terms, um, but you, you might have a tool that fails to differentiate on the flight level between good flights and bad flights. So precision is also very important. Uh, and we're also putting a premium on transparency because we want to, wherever possible, be uh, fully you know, go full Monty really on both the data sources and the 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 models that are used to do the fuel burn cal- calculation. So, really, those three principles are the core ones. Um, you know, on accuracy, there's a lot of work ongoing within the advisory committee on how to validate the travel impact model um, in order to make it really fit as closely as possible to airline actual data. Uh, Precision goes back to the model that we're using that really is able to differentiate carbon emissions at the per flight level. Um, I will caveat this. Everything we're doing is a prediction and it's, it's a relatively tricky one. Um, we're using historical data, for example, from 2020 to 2023 to try and predict emissions from a future flight. So there'll always be limitations on how accurate and precise we can get. Uh, but we are really um, building out the model such that it um, it rewards airlines for everything they can do to reduce emissions, whether that's newer planes, whether it's um, higher load factors, whether it's carrying belly cargo, or eventually adopting things like sustainable aviation fuels. Just wanted to touch on transparency again. Um, there are a lot of models out there that are kind of black boxes. Uh, so our work is really focusing on using open source models and being completely transparent about the data sources that we use to drive them. So um, I think those are the kind of three key principles and and help differentiate this work from some of the other models that are out there. So let's step back a little. You're doing a lot of technical work, but it's like I'm a flyer and you're telling me what is the speed of the engine fan blade when it's spinning while I'm flying. I don't really care as a flyer. So Given that this is being presented on Google Flights, I totally appreciate the focus on precision and accuracy. But when I go search for flights, I just sort by price. Some will sort by schedule. You don't really... Are are people actually, firstly, looking at CO2 emissions of flights on Google Flights? And if so, what level of detail is enough to not confuse them? Yeah, yeah. So... Two thoughts here. Um, first of all, Google has released a little bit of data on the uptake of the uh, the emissions estimates on their side, and I would say preliminarily they're they're pretty positive. So they we're getting a read now uh, through the Google Flights website on what fraction of the 
um, consumers who book tickets on Google Flights are actually referencing the emissions data. Do you um, have a and, number? Off the top uh, of your not head? off the top of my head. Um, I should have prepared one, but I didn't. Um, but <laughs> no I know worries. that the results are 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 pretty good. Um, but I do want to draw a distinction between um, preparing the data and displaying the data, because the travel impact model is actually used across a variety of booking platforms now. Not only Google Flights, but Booking.com and Expedia and Skyscanner. So my job actually is purely on um, what data to uh, deliver. It's not actually about the display of the data. That's more that that's a decision that the individual booking platforms are going to make. And we do expect some diversity on that. But the goal is to roll all of the data up to a, a really understandable number for consumers. So currently it's CO2 equivalent of um, long of long lived climate forcers, we'll call it. Uh, but also we're we're discussing how to uh, display the data on contrail impact. And that's that's trickier. We we I can certainly dig into that as well for you. Yeah, so let's dig into that for a minute. I remember about a year or one and a half years ago, Google went overnight from all emissions data to CO2 only, and I could compare booking.com or kayak results and suddenly they were twice as much uh, or even more than what Google was displaying. And obviously, emissions had not decreased for aircraft flying overnight. Now, you have recently released and updated the travel impact model to include all six Kyoto greenhouse gases, to uh, include well-to-tank emissions by default, and also uh, integrate cargo. And this is in addition to non-CO2. How has this worked out and why the focus on including these items? Yeah, yeah. So here we're really focusing on in, in improving the comprehensiveness of the model and then uh, putting in place what we need to future-proof it. So, for example, in order to really get sustainable aviation fuels right and to credit airlines with their emission reductions, you, you need to take into account the energy that's used to produce fuels upstream of the aircraft. That's like a key step. So what we're doing here is really making sure that we, um, we're, it, the model itself can start to it, take inputs like sustainable aviation fuel uptake and translate that into a, a CO2 reduction. Um, so that's one thought. Um, maybe to talk specifically about the contrails. Um, one thing that we're very explicitly trying to do through the travel impact model work is to um, change behavior, right? We want to give data to the consumers that allow them to choose lower remitting flights first and foremost. Uh, but we also know that the estimates that we're providing are, are inevitably they're going to impact how airlines do their business, what planes they buy and what fuels they buy. Uh, the analogy here is sort of like car calorie counts for um, menus at restaurants. Um, you know, we've seen those take off recently, and there's actually been some good science about this. And uh, it concludes maybe surprisingly, that calorie counts on menus have influenced chef behavior more than they've influenced diner behavior. Uh, because as soon as you get like a new, uh, like a, a calorie count on the menu, uh, chefs start to think about how to create new dishes that actually reduce that number. So people continue to come to the restaurants. Um, so we, we are very explicitly trying to uh, change consumer behavior um, and airline behavior. That multiplier that you just um, you just referenced, kind of previously, Google Flights had a 1.6 times multiplier of the CO2 emissions in order to take into account things like contrails. Um, that's fine, but it's just a straight multiplier. It doesn't distinguish any flights or any airlines from each other. And so um, it actually wasn't very useful in, in modifying the behavior. Where we are going is to um, better differentiation at the level of geography, time of day, and seasonality to actually differentiate the flights and make them actionable for consumers and airlines. So I'm going to dive right into this. Has it been actionable? Have you seen a change in customer behavior while you display CO2 plus or CO2 E emissions? It's it's really a question for the booking platforms. Um, I 
I know that Google has seen definitely people referencing the data. Uh, we also did a side event at COP28 in which uh, United Airlines participated. Uh, and they also indicated that um, once they started to, in, uh, to integrate CO2 emissions into their search on the United platform, they were seeing significant click through. So there's basically you would provide a CO2 estimate and then there's there was a button that said, like, what does this mean? And I think I think on the order of 10 percent of people were clicking that uh, it was it was pretty high. I don't think there's been any research yet would actually links this back to which tickets people are purchasing. But um, preliminary evidence is that people are actually seeing the number and they're curious about it and they're they're clicking that link that um, that teaches them more about it. Yeah, I would be curious to see what the conversion, actual conversions number are from Google. You mentioned COP28 in Dubai, where you were. Tell us about that and your take on the outcomes, because you were at this side event uh, that was being organized, I believe, by ATAG for the aviation industry. Who attended? What was the response? Was there a lot of talk or some action as well? Uh, so I went to a number of side events and organized some side events at COP28. Uh, so there was a lot of energy um, at the meeting itself. Uh, the IATA event or the um, the airlines event, it was huge. It was actually four hours and there were probably 30 some speakers uh, over that four hour period. So definitely a lot of energy. Um, the focus was very much on alternative fuels and the outcome of the um, UN meeting on sustainable aviation fuels, which happened, I think, two weeks before um, COP28. Um, and that, at that meeting, there was a global agreement uh, for um, that, that airlines should attempt to reduce the carbon intensity of their fuels by 5% by 2030 through the adoption of sustainable aviation fuels. So a lot of the talk actually was focused less on emissions disclosure and more about that outcome and what policies governments need to put in place to support it. And of course, this took place just on the heels of the ICAO. Uh, meetings where the aviation industry res actually resolved to cut emissions by 5% by 2030. Do you think we can get there, given how unequally SAF is distributed right now? Yeah, that's one of the key challenges. Um, as you know, ICAO agreed to the goal for of net zero international aviation by 2050. And so that's where a lot of the energy is going now. Um, I mean, a 5% reduction in carbon intensity ballpark, it, it, it equates to about a 6% sustainable aviation fuel uptake by, 20, by 2030. Um, not coincidentally, that's the requirement in Europe. So Europe has this refuel EU mandate, which has a volumetric target of 6% by 2030. So really, if you look at the results, it was sort of taking a regulation in Europe and establishing that as like an aspirational goal globally. And there was definitely friction about that, right? Because um, Europe and the US and you know Japan, for example, these are rich countries that have a lot of technology that and, and are already investing in sustainable aviation fuels. The friction was uh, how appropriate is that 6% value for um, African countries, for example, or the global South in general, right? Whether that's realistic for them or not. So then while still staying in Dubai, at the Dubai Air Show, there were record orders. And Paris Air Show before that, over a thousand airplanes ordered only from India. We're not even going beyond. Uh, and the interesting thing is most of these aircraft will be fly delivered in 2030 and they will continue flying perhaps in 2050 and beyond. Is SAF the only game in town given that these are almost all current technology aircraft? No hydrogen or electric as far as I recall. Yeah. It's a really important question. And if you look at the commercial market forecasts for the manufacturers, you know, they are predicting something on the order of 40,000 aircraft deliveries over the next 20 years. Um, and a lot of those, as you, as you noted, are they're going to be existing technologies because the manufacturers are not really putting out new, more fuel efficient aircraft types right now. Um, so we're actually analyzing this exact question right now. Um, and the entry point here is, is what we call scope three emissions. 
So to define the term, scope three emissions are emissions associated with uh, the use of a product over its lifetime after it's been provided to the consumer. So in this case, Boeing or Air, uh, Airbus or Embraer, they deliver an aircraft to an airline. And then subsequently that, that aircraft is used for say 25 years. And the scope three emissions are the manufacturer's estimate of how large those emissions will be. Um, manufacturers have started to, to report scope three emissions as part of sustainability reporting. So you can go in a year on year, you can see Boeing and Airbus's estimates for how much their planes that were delivered, say, in 2022 will emit through 2050, for example. And so we're starting to crunch the numbers around them. The, to be honest, the numbers are pretty sobering. So if you if you look at kind of the a net zero pathway for aviation by 2050, you can derive a carbon budget from them from that. It'll tell you how much collectively the airlines can emit, and then you can link that back to the new aircraft sales. And um, it's it's the results are really quite interesting. And you'll see a full report from the ICCT on this. It, probably in three months or so. Um, point one, and this is interesting. If you look at the committed emissions from all of the planes that are already in service, so that is just looking at the fleet in 2024, and you, you run the thought experiment of let's run all of those planes until they would naturally be retired. If you run that calculation, you're already consuming 40% of a net zero CO2 budget. So if you look at sort of the budget we have through 2050, just the planes we have today, not any new planes, that's going to use up about 40% of it. Um, if you then do the projection out of new deliveries over time, you, you, you need to kind of adopt scenarios in order to balance sort of a low technology scenario versus a high technology scenario. Um, but on average, if you do that estimate, you conclude that around 2035, every new aircraft that is delivered will need to be zero emission over its lifetime in order for us to meet a net zero 2050 goal. And so there are a couple of ways you could do that, right? It could be a, a new aircraft delivered in 2035 that is compatible with 100% SAFs. And then subsequently you use a zero emission SAF through its entire lifetime. Alternatively, it might be a hydrogen aircraft or an electric aircraft where also that fuel is produced with zero emissions upstream. But yeah, the numbers are, are pretty sobering and do point directly to the need for massive adoption of sustainable aviation fuels, especially if an alternative like technology like hydrogen doesn't come to pass. Can I just repeat this once for everyone listening? From 2035 onwards, every single aircraft delivered will need to be resulting in no additional emissions for aviation to meet its carbon budget, given how many existing technology aircraft are already being delivered. What this also means, like what, what this also means essentially is every single new aircraft being delivered has to be electric or hydrogen or tied to SAF volumes that can take care of its entire lifetime operation. Am I right to say that? That is our calculation. Uh, and there there is some uncertainty. Um, if you assume greater fuel efficiency gains, um, then you can delay that, we'll call it the break-even year, a little bit. Uh, alternatively, if you assume that there are no new aircraft types um, and limited SAF uptake in the 2020s, then that year gets pushed even sooner. But on average, it's about 2035. That's, that's, the, that's the breaking point in which we need to make a hard pivot to zero aviation, zero emission aviation at the manufacturer level. I cannot wait for the air show that happens next, where the airline announces, oh, I have ordered 500 aircraft, and here's my SAF agreement with these companies to make sure that 100% of the fuel that goes in these 500 aircraft will be sustainable aviation fuel. That's that's my dream uh, to, to see. I've heard you talk about it, and uh, it, it's it's an intriguing idea. Um, we do need to be careful, right? Because anytime an airline purchases a new aircraft, um, it, it, it there are two directions this could go emissions-wise. If it's used to replace an older, less fuel-efficient aircraft, 
that's a, that ends up as a reduction in emissions, right? Because it typically a, a new aircraft is about 50, 15% more fuel efficient than the aircraft is delivered. The flip side is if it's, if it's used to serve a new route, in which case it's a little bit better than what could have been, but it's still new traffic. It's still new emissions. And again, that's a number that we're going to release with this new report is our prediction of sort of uh, in a given year, what share of new aircraft being delivered are replacing older aircraft versus just servicing new routes. So this is interesting, right? Uh, just building on this debate a bit further, while in the developed world, routes and cities are already well served. We really don't need the 10th daily flight between the UK and somewhere in Florida. I think Brits have ample ways to get to Disneyland if they really want to. Yet, if you look at ultra low cost airlines, the likes of Wiz, uh, going into regions like Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia, where there is indeed growth market. And I think that's a smart strategy because you can't just keep growing within Europe, which is their traditional base. You are looking after growth markets. Similarly, if you look at markets like Turkey or India or Indonesia, there is a lot of growth coming. At which point, does the Western world really have a stature to say, hey, stop growing just because we have burned through the carbon budget um, flying the thousand planes that we have in our fleet? Yeah, uh, great point. And, and if you look at the historical traffic patterns and historical emissions, um, high income countries have been responsible for about 70% of aviation emissions to date. And they're only about 16% of the world's population. So it's very imbalanced. And I completely agree with you. Um, it, it's, it's very hypocritical for a rich country that has benefited from decades of, you know, aviation growth to say to a, you know, an emerging economy, reduce your emissions, even as those richer countries grow their airports, grow those airlines. That's really just not, it's not okay. I was, I was having an interesting debate with a friend recently who is European and a white male to be specific. And he was saying, oh, you know, his point was, oh, look at all that growth coming from India and China. And a point I made to him was, guess what? India, the country of my birth, uh, in India, less than 1% of its population has flown internationally. So what right does anyone have to tell Indians don't fly? Yes, please fly and see the world and make it smaller uh, in, in in doing so. I think travel, I think you are on, on the same page with me on this. Travel makes the world smaller and a better place. We just have to do it right. It's not flying that's the enemy. It's the emissions, it's the CO2. And we have to tackle that head on. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very important. Um, what about SAF mandates? The real reality is SAF today is only 0.2% of our fuel supply. Most airlines, to, even the leading edge, edge airlines, struggle to have even 1% of SAF in their entire uh, fleet. Where will this come from? Yeah. I think SAF ma mandates are going to be critical. We do have... Uh, several now, actually, but the most important one is in Europe. That's the refuel EU mandate, uh, which uh, starts out low. Uh, the requirement is for 2% SAF um, starting in 2025, going up to 6% in 2030. And then there's a big jump between 2030 and 2035. It jumps up to 20%. Um, but we're, we're pretty impressed by the design of the refuel EU mandate. Um, it is a volumetric mandate. So that means that the requirement is basically liters of SAF, um, but it does come with pretty strict feedstock requirements. So in general, only SAFs which produce, which produce significant emission reductions will be allowed under the system. So we're pretty happy about that. Um, the story is more complicated in the U.S. right now. Um, currently, there are no mandates in the U.S. The U.S. is approaching it through the incentive side, for example, under the Inflation Reduction Act. And there's a big political fight right now about what SAS should qualify. With a lot of airline energy going 
uh, going behind trying to reward SAFs from corn and soybeans. And that's, that's a real concern because we, we know the science tells us that um, using crops to produce SAFs actually can have very significant um, land use impacts, essentially driving de- deforestation in, uh, in um, parts of the world that increase rather than reduce emissions. But uh, in balance, I think mandates and another similar policy called a low carbon fuel standard will be very important. We just need to get the details right on the feedstock quality. So while we're on feedstocks, I know the EU has very strict requirements and the US does not. So biofuels are all game over there. But what I heard recently was something interesting in the US, which was because there's so much demand from California and Oregon to get these biofuels into uh, aviation, there is, let's, this oil is coming from somewhere. So the oil producers in Iowa are now diverting oil away from other industries. This is not waste cooking oil. This is so, farm yeah, oil, oils. Yeah. right? This is, these are virgin oils. And that is resulting in shortage of oils in traditional industries. And that has resulted in the imports of palm oil from Malaysia into the U.S. to shoot up just because there's a substitution and there's a higher price for, obviously, SAF than uh, the traditional uses of oil. And I think somebody needs to zoom out and just look at what is the impact on overall uh, oil sourcing rather than only within aviation. Exactly, exactly. And um, I mean, those would generally be called displacement emissions. So when you have an existing use for an oily feedstock and you divert it to something new, then what backfills that demand? And um, this is somewhat new to me. The The issue of palm oil being diverted to Europe is actually an old one that's been going on for a number of years. And it's very concerning from an environmental standpoint. Um, it sounds like is starting to happen in the U.S. as well, which is sobering because we we produce so much soybean oil. If that is being, well, we do know it's being diverted to road transport in particular right now. And if that is true, then the the fact that we now have palm oil coming into the U.S., that would that would raise a red flag for me for, for uh, transport fuel policy generally. Exactly. I think that this is so critical. Let's move on to another important topic, which is budget. We have seen estimations that getting to net zero will cost the aviation industry anywhere from 4 to $5 trillion. Just for context, the entire revenue of all the airlines combined in the world is $1 trillion. Airlines are about a $1 trillion industry. And that is in a good year. Uh, and we know about these swings uh, that we're familiar with. Where is this money going to come from? Who is going to pay for this? Yeah, well, it's going to be a combination of government support and airlines, um, with the caveat that fundamentally airlines are they're going to generate the revenue from passengers, right? Because that's who buys the ticket. Um, and uh, it's unclear what the share will be between those two. Um, we've done some analysis, kind of looking at the technologies that you know we need both on the planes and the fuel side, and then um, their technological maturity and their costs. And again, I'm quoting from from research that isn't out yet, but it will be out soon. I mean, our conclusion was that uh, the ideal split is probably 20%, 80%. And that is of that four to $5 trillion price tag, governments probably need to support about a fifth of it. And then the airlines and then by proxy, the consumers should be covering about four fifths of it. Um, but there's there's a really interesting debate right now about how to generate that revenue. And part of it focuses on the equity question um, and how to raise the revenue in such a way that you don't price the um, poorer consumers in poorer countries out of the aviation market. <laughs> so obviously, next question, how do you do that? <laughs> well. Uh, the good news is that in general, taxing aviation is inherently progressive. So we know ballpark that about 40% of the flights in any given year is taken by 2% of the world's population, the frequent flyers in essence. 
And those frequent flyers tend to be disproportionately wealthy. No surprise there. Um, aviation, I get in trouble when I say this, but aviation is a luxury good defined as, as you, as someone, you know, increases their income, they tend to spend proportionately more of that dollar on flying. So it is a luxury good. Uh, so the, the starting point is that taxing aviation generally tends to be quite progressive. Um, there are ways to make it more progressive. And one of the ideas that you know, has been kicked around now is the idea of a frequent flying levy. And that is instead of having like a flat ticket tax, um, you have a an escalating tax based upon the number of times that a consumer flies in a year. Um, and we've analyzed this um, comparing a flat tax of $25 per flight to an escalating frequent flyer levy where um, everyone's first flight in a year is free their second flight is taxed like $9 and then up and up and up escalating to something like $200 for the 20th flight. Um, so we've compared those two approaches and you do see that um, a frequent flying levy would be even more progressive than flat taxation. So by comparison, like a, a flat uh, tax on tickets would raise about 63% of the revenue from the richest 10% of the world whereas a frequent flying levy would raise 90% of the revenue from uh, the richest 10%. That's very interesting. I wonder what my friends who take about 100 flights a year will say to that, many of them and most of them in business class. Uh, the interesting thing is there's been a lot of pushback from this, from airlines, of course, because frequent flyers are the most profitable passengers that they have. How do we get airlines on board to a scheme like that who are concerned that their highest paying passengers are just going to go to another airline which doesn't have this. Yeah, this is a tricky one. And it's not so conceptually, the frequent flyer levy does a lot of interesting things. Um, if you analyze it, for example, at the country level, um, you could find that the 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 revenue that you would raise um, is it very closely tracks each country's contribution to historical emissions. So, for example, I gave you that that fact um, earlier that um, if you look at historical aviation emissions, rich countries uh, are responsible for about 70 percent of it. Um, that's actually the share of revenue that would be generated from rich countries under a go global frequent flying levy. And the reason that is interesting and, and important is anytime you talk about a global agreement, there's always the question about equity and making sure that um, the richest countries pay their fair share. And so one of the interesting things about a frequent flying levy is at a global scale, it actually might do that. It might actually um, track historical emissions quite closely. Um, but there are drawbacks. Um, a lot of people have pointed to privacy as an issue. Uh, there are questions about how you might distinguish work flights from private flights because you would not want an example uh, where someone flies 15 times in a year for work travel, and then their 16th flight is in December to go back to like India to visit their family, and suddenly they get a $1,200 tax bill, right? That doesn't seem fair. Um, and then the airlines themselves, obviously, um, they there's this question of like, how you would standardize the system so it wouldn't drive the most valuable passengers from one airline to the other. These are non-trivial questions. So I don't want to represent a frequent flying levy as it's it's obvious we're going to do it. Don't worry about it. Um, I am, but, but, but we should recognize that airlines think about this question all the time. I mean, they have incredibly sophisticated mechanisms for taking the same product and selling it at a variety of prices. Um, across the consumers. Um, they're already very good at this. So um, I have no doubt that they already, uh, airlines already know internally, for example, if I have to in invest an additional $200 million a year in decarbonization technologies, how, how should we spread that across our consumers such that uh, the rich pay more and the, 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 less well-off folks pay less so that it's all equitable. They already know how to do this. The question is how you get them to do it. Um, 
I, I'm I'm really interested in learning more about um, fair classes myself, um, because um, I think the secret might be in there, because that's how airlines already distinguish um, work travelers from leisure travelers, and then um, the, like people who um, buy who fly frequently and might buy a ticket one day out versus those that only fly once a year and they purchase the tickets three months in advance. That's all already something the airlines are really good at. I'm curious in learning more as an alternative to a frequent flying levy, which might be hard to implement. How might we leverage kind of that knowledge already? So this is very interesting. This has been a lot of the work we have done with airlines on segmentation of customers, micro targeting of customers and ensuring that they get a very different CX customer experience or passenger experience, not just on the day of travel, but all the way from searching the flight to booking the flight. And you're right. Airlines are very good at identifying and then serving something custom. In fact, we worked a few years ago with an airline where when you search for a flight, you would see a custom landing page. You don't know it's custom. That landing page does not exist if you don't click on it. And it dynamically appears for you, for your search, for your destination from your origin. When you search, it's not a search result. It's a completely custom landing page. And when you click on it, your conversion rate obviously is much higher. Skyscanner took this to another level where they had um, completely branded pages for the airline in the airline's colors without leaving the Skyscanner website when people Mm -hmm. are going through the booking flow. Again, impacting uh, conversion. There are some frequent flyers programs that now have dynamic pricing as well offered to consumers based on a last minute booking you're paying more miles versus less miles so i think this can be done and the will needs to be there it's not that it hasn't been done before it's not that we are asking for something new but this just needs to be cordoned off and you know you you need to figure out how to do it um i think we can brainstorm about this for another hour here on on this episode uh but that's that's when we go uh do it in Atlanta under the, what was the corn that you led me to? Uh, corn court. Yes. The I'm corn very court. jealous that you saw that. I've never seen it. <laughs> you led me, you guided me really well uh, under the corn court. And at 1 a.m. in Atlanta, I saw the corn court. While we're talking about supersonic, we have to, we have to talk, talk to Dan Rutherford about boom supersonic. Well, you I talk about it too much. So it's totally fair you, for you to ask me. You, you are a fanboy. You have a love-hate relationship with Boom Super Boom Supersonic. I don't know who loves who and who hates who, but I don't think you're quite convinced that they will fly supersonic across the Atlantic or the Pacific in the 2030s, do you? No, no. Um, and let me take the critique very general. Um, it, it's really about the economic viability of supersonic flight, first and foremost before you talk about the environmental impact. And, and we know this well from the, the Concorde, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Um, the plane was extremely uh, fuel inefficient, so it was expensive to fly. And you also couldn't fly at very many places because of the sonic boom. Uh, so um, in most parts of the world, supersonic aircraft are still not allowed to fly over land. Uh, so it's purely an international and transoceanic market. Um, and that might change in the, you know, mid 2030s, maybe by 2040, based upon some work that NASA is actually doing with, uh, with, uh, Lockheed Martin on this low boom uh, demonstration aircraft. But fundamentally, we've crunched the numbers and, uh, it looks like you would need both low boom aircraft that can operate over land and super cheap sustainable aviation fuels to make the economics work. And I I think it's, um, I mean, to agree with something that Boom says, they they refer to the return of supersonic aircraft as inevitable. And I sort of agree with that. Like you assume we're gonna break the sound barrier again commercially at some point. But by my analysis, it really needs to be after we have low boom aircraft and super cheap sustainable aviation fuels. And I just don't see that happening in five years. Yeah, the cheap sustainable aviation fuel, that's the one that trumps me. It's one thing to go after technology, but the the price of sustainable aviation fuel, I'm not sure if it's coming down so quickly that 
supersonic might be profitable. Now, on that note, let's move on to the final and possibly the most exciting part of this interview, which is the rapid fire round. Oh, I think nice. We did, I, did, I think we did the version of this when we last spoke, but let's be current on this. We'll start with something right. easy. What's your favorite airline then? Oh, um, I really like ANA. My wife is from Japan, and when uh, when we fly back to visit her family, we try to get a ticket on ANA. I will say, however, I recently flew them, and their food was surprisingly bad. Um, I blame Zip Air, to be honest. It's just it's, there's a new price war. I appreciate <laughs> the low prices, but you know that service is going to have to cut somewhere. Have you tried Have you tried the very cheap? Full flat business class on Zipair, by the way. Uh, no, no, I have not. Do you recommend <laughs> give it, it? Give it a shot sometime. I've heard some decent reviews about just buying a full flat bed for the price of premium economy and getting nothing else. No lounge, no food. It's an overnight flight anyway. You might just sleep through it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we've flown Zipair a number of times and we, we actually had a good experience, but um, I'm linking the two. I'm making, I'm, I'm making the logic jump, but... Um, I used right. to love ANA's food, and then I flew them recently, and it was not not great. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. Now, the next question is: What is your favorite airport? Ooh, my favorite airport. Um, that is a great question. I do not like the airports that are gigantic malls. Um, <laughs> I'm not a shopper. And so I don't really get into that. I would say San Jose. I think San Jose is a really convenient in airport. Out. It's super easy to get in and out of, and it's there are no frills. I I, I appreciate that. Yeah, on, on the San Jose note, I love Long Beach, California. I can oh see, yeah, oh yeah. I can see the aircraft, uh, the JetBlue flight I flew out on when I got out of the Uber. I could see my plane, and that was so rare and I amazing. Totally agree. I think it takes like two minutes to transit yes. the terminal coming off the plane. Yeah, exactly. Favorite city, Dan? Oh, I love Hong Kong circa 2015, I want to say. it's It was such a fantastic, like, kind of gritty but incredibly beautiful city um, with really robust civil society um, in Asia where there are way too many cities that are just, like, super clean and high-tech and soulless. So um, I suspect things have changed now, but I really, really loved Hong Kong. Are you by any chance referring to the city that I grew up in, Singapore, high-tech city? Um, so Maybe. <laughs> Sorry for the insult there. <laughs> All right. We, we have two debates then to settle afterwards. Right. Uh, what's your favorite movie then? Oh, um, I love District 9. Uh, if you're familiar with that, Neil Blomkopf. Uh, Great movie, great zero to hero story, um, really funny in parts. And then there's a lot of pathos in it, if you recall. Um, him being separated from his wife. Uh, also, just the backstory of the, the aliens themselves as sort of oppressed and misunderstood. Um, that movie has it all. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm going to check it out. I'm so glad that you did not say Top Gun. Uh, <laughs> I think that has to be one of the most popular movies ever mentioned on this podcast amongst the guests I've had. I bet. Uh, what, is, uh, what are you doing in your free time? Yeah, uh, these days I'm having a lot of fun uh, supporting my daughter in track and field. Um, How old is she? It's kind of a surprise. So my daughter is a junior in high school, but uh, it came out of nowhere two years ago. Um, it was hidden by COVID because yeah. during middle school there was no there were no track competitions, but out of nowhere, my daughter turns out to be um, one of the fastest sprinters in California. And so uh, we're having a lot of fun bonding with her, taking her to meets, um, weightlifting together. And uh, yeah, she's blazing fast and her parents are not. So that's, uh, that's been fun. Wow. Wow. Okay. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. For sure. For sure. Okay, interesting. What is something that you want to learn? Hmm. I would really, I would love to learn French as a language. I think it's a okay. really interesting culture, interesting language. I know I'm never going to do it because I, in my 20s, I learned Japanese. And it was such a uh -oh. traumatic experience <laughs> that I just know I'm never going to do a third language. But I'd love to if I could. 
That's so interesting because in my 20s, I learned Mandarin. And it wasn't as traumatic. I think I was decent enough to bargain in Beijing in the markets. And that was fun. But then, mm. you know, not living in Singapore, moving out west, I just lost touch with Mandarin. And I thought I'll never learn from scratch another language. But then I started doing a lot of work in the Middle East or in Latin America. And I realized I could get Spanish really easily. Or I could uh, nice. I could actually understand Arabic and get fluent in it if I wanted to. And I think there's always hope in other languages. So French might be your savior here. Uh, if you were on an 18-hour long flight with someone, who would you like as your seatmate for that flight? And this person can be... Alive or not alive? Oh, alive or not alive? Um, boy, that's a great question. I almost said Henry David Thoreau there, but he would be an awful seatmate. I was I was enraptured <laughs> by Walden when I was younger, uh, and now I've come to appreciate that he's kind of a misanthrope. Who would I love to sit next to? Um. Boy, you really stumped me with this one. It, I mean, I assume it would be one of the great thinkers. Oh, um, let me, let me, actually, I'm going to link it to Hen Henry David Thoreau. Let me, let me throw in Gandhi because he, because he he'll ran be flying, with He'll be flying 64D, not oh. up front. Yeah, yeah, well, that's where I am anyway. Uh, <laughs> no, I'd love to learn from him and he linked... He took the civil disobedience ideas that Henry David Thoreau originally kind of piloted and obviously was sub tremendously successful with him in India. And then it fed into the civil rights movement in the U.S. and Martin Luther King. So, yeah, that would be great. I'd love to learn that. Oh, wow. Fantastic. I'll, I'll book the other side. We'll put him in the middle seat, okay? All right. We'll, we'll, we'll do I don't this. think he gets the middle seat. I think I get the middle <laughs> seat in that case. <laughs> Okay, final question. If we are speaking one year from now, hopefully on the the seventh edition of this podcast, if we are speaking one year from now and we are popping champagne, what are we celebrating? I think we are celebrating, um, yeah, why, why? widespread uptake of low carbon travel search. That would be my main thing. I mean, a lot of the technologies we talked about today are these are long-term revolutions right whether it's power to liquids or hydrogen aircraft or even maybe contrail abatement which we didn't talk about um that's going to take time but i think um making sure that consumers understand the impact of their flying and then choose less emitting flights is that's like the key enabling step from the consumer side. So I would love to see a year from now, 10% of people in the world choosing tickets as a function of their emissions. And um, there is some data that suggests we can get there. Uh, Lufthansa, apparently 10% of their consumers now within Europe are choosing what they call green fares. Oh, Germany, yeah. domestic. Germany, thank you. Thank you for correcting. Uh, domestic yeah, Germany. So um, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a start. But um, yeah, hopefully that's what we're celebrating in a year's time. That's exactly so. I, I just want to build on that. I want to. I would like to celebrate not just people who are searching low carbon fares, who are converting. I want to celebrate that ten percent to increase by three x to thirty percent in the next year. And I think then okay. we're onto something because you're then you're actually changing consumer behavior, which is what you would like to achieve with uh, with Tim, isn't it? Exactly. Yep. I like the uh, ambition. <laughs> well, I think we are all doing our bits and we shall hopefully get there. Thank you very much, Dan. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you once again for the fresh new insights. And once again, you are our first guest who's doing a round two on the podcast. Thanks again. Wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainability in the Air. Aviation is one of the hardest to decarbonize industries. Yet, there are multiple paths to get to net zero. Awareness is key to a green future. So please give us your support to help our sustainable aviation insights reach a wider audience. You can do this by sharing this episode on your network, on LinkedIn, Twitter, or even WhatsApp. Or perhaps you might consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever 
you listen to this episode. You can start a conversation with us by writing to us at podcast at simplifying that's simply with an I dot com. And for more content on sustainable aviation, please visit our website green dot simplifying dot com and join the movement. Sustainability in the air is an original podcast by Simplifying. The show is produced by Uri Torf in Slovakia. Dirk Singer is our director of sustainability who leads research for each interviewee out of Greenwich, UK. Shubhadeep Pal is our supervising editor based out of Mumbai and Singapore. The articles are written by Ayushi Badola in Dehradun in India and Meera Hull in Montreal, Quebec. Creative design is led by Lihia Esteve in Montreal. Baiba Dreamen is the project director for the show based out of Valencia, Spain. Special thanks to Wendy Sim in Singapore. And I'm Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simplifying and your host. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn.